Hello, I'm Edward Hirsch. It's a pleasure to introduce my friend and brother, Philip Levine, one of the greatest living American poets. I've been reading his work since I was 18 years old, which is to say for 45 years now. It has been one of the most sustaining experiences of my poetry life. I've been enriched beyond measure by his work and also by his friendship. It thus gives me special satisfaction to present Philip Levine with the Wallace Stevens Award from the Academy of American Poets. This is our most distinguished prize, and we've found a wonderfully worthy recipient. Philip Levine has created a fundamentally human-centered poetry. His 16 books of poems have established him as one of our strongest contemporary heirs to Walt Whitman and William Carlos Williams. He's a poet of social justice and memory, a singer who took an oath to remember, a storyteller determined to stand up for the victimized, the disenfranchised. His poems recall the fallen, but they also take up the anarchist dream of freedom and justice, the chant of, we shall inherit. He envisions a new world. Levine has often praised the stubborn will of the dispossessed to dig in and endure. This determination is at the heart of his central vision. The motif of regeneration and rebirth resounds throughout his work, which sounds what Wallace Stevens called the no that precedes the final yes. For all of its furious denunciations, Levine's poetry ends by being a poetry of praise for a world that runs on and on in its own sweet will. He's ultimately a romantic poet, an American Keats, who believes in the boundlessness of human possibility. Please welcome Philip Levine. Well, I would like to thank the audience that's been so patient. Uh, I would like to th thank the chancellors, all of them, even the ones who didn't vote for me, um, <laughs> because it's, it's hard work to read all these poets. I would like to thank my three great editors, George Hitchcock of Kayak Books, uh, Harry Ford of Athenaeum, and then Knopf, and my present editor, Anne Close. Not once did any one of the three ever ask me to change anything besides my clothing. Uh, <laughs> They let me create my books for better or worse. <clears throat> and you may judge whether they did a decent job or not. I'm just going to read two poems, uh, neither too long. <laughs> You've been so patient. Uh, this is about... Art Tatum, the great jazz pianist, who you may, you should know, was blind. Uh, certainly blind when I met him and saw him in Detroit, which is where I'm from. It's called On the Corner. Standing on the corner until Tatum passed, blind as the sea, heavy, tottering, on the arm of the young bass player, and they both talking Jackie Robinson. It was cold, late, and the flame show bar was crashing for the night, even Johnny Ray calling it quits. Tatum said, can't believe how fast he is to first. Wait till you see Mays, the bass player said. Women in white furs spilled out of the bars and trickled toward the parking lot. Now it could rain, coming straight down. The man in the brown hat never turned his head up. The gutters swirled their heavy waters. The streets reflected the sky, which was nothing. Tatum stamped on toward the Bland Hotel. A wet newspaper stuck to his shoe his mouth open, his vest drawn and darkening. 
I can't hardly wait, he said. And that's an old poem. It's from this book, The Names of the Lost, which you can't find anymore. Uh, but that's OK. It's still there. Oh, you can get it in the library. You could probably get it from, you know, someplace else. Everything is available. <laughs> I'm trying to find this poem. Yeah, I want to read a recent poem. So you can judge if I'm getting worse or better. Uh, I rarely read my own older poems because they shame me. I see all the things I stole <laughs> and how much worse I got. This also takes place in Detroit. It's called The Future. The past is no more past than the future, or so said Meridian, the unlikely seer of my senior shop class. I'll call him John, although he was never a John, or even a Juan or a Jack, although his surname, Meridian, ended with I-A-N, which is Ian in Scotland, Gaelic, the Gaelic version of John, our John, John Meridian, gone 67 years ago from our classroom into the wider world of war where his one-way ticket got punched. I could start this again, if I could, start quietly with a Dougie or an Allen both of whom made it into their 30s, though neither ever spoke of the past being anything but over. What they actually thought, I'll never know. One spring day, the whole class went by bus to the foundry at Ford Rouge to see earth melted and poured like syrup into fire. Look up, someone said, maybe Dougie or Alan. So I did and saw way up above the collisions of metal and men a family of sparrows in the trapped light trapped themselves or perhaps out to reclaim their lost space. Speaking of perhaps, perhaps I'm dawdling because I haven't seen John or Alan or Dougie in over 50 years. Perhaps I just like repeating their names as though that could help them or perhaps help me. And it does. It helps me. They're beyond my help. Later, the class picnicked on egg salad beside a wide stream that fed our filthy river. Alan, or maybe it was Dougie, managed to cross the water, leaping from rock to rock and then back again. His balance was that good. Alan or maybe Dougie, whoever had crossed dared me to try. But I knew enough, even then, not to. I remember the sky darkening in the east, the bus arriving with the rain, the windows steaming up to hide the flooded streets. I remember I sat next to Alan, who lied a blue streak about an older girl who owned her own car. The bus driver lost the way and had to stop at a filling station in Del Rey to get directions. So the trip was endless. I got back before nightfall, but the day kept going on and on into the future. Thank you all. <laughs>